This is Frank McGee, NBC News in Washington. This is the second in a series of programs unmatched in history. Never have so many people seen the major candidates for President of the United States at the same time. And never, until this series, have Americans seen the candidates in face-to-face -face exchange. Tonight, the candidates have agreed to devote the full hour to answering questions on any issue of the campaign. And here tonight are the Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. Now, representatives of the candidates and of all the radio and television networks have agreed on these rules. Neither candidate will make an opening statement or a closing summation. Each will be questioned in turn. Each will have an opportunity to comment upon the answer of the other. Each reporter will ask only one question in turn. He is free to ask any question he chooses. Neither candidate knows what questions will be asked and only the clock will determine who will be asked the last question. These programs represent an unprecedented opportunity for the candidates to present their philosophies and programs directly to the people and for the people to compare these and the candidates. The four reporters on tonight's panel include a newspaper man and a wire service representative. These two were selected by lot by the press secretaries of the candidates from among the reporters traveling with the candidates. The broadcasting representatives were selected by their respective companies. The reporters are Paul Niven of CBS, Edward P. Morgan of ABC, Alvin Spivak of United Press International, and Harold R. Levy of Newsday. Now the first question is from Mr. Niven and is for Vice President Nixon. Mr. Vice President, Senator Kennedy said last night that the administration must take responsibility for the loss of Cuba. Would you compare the validity of that statement with the validity of your own statements in previous campaigns that the Truman administration was responsible for the loss of China to the communists? First of all, I don't agree with Senator Kennedy that Cuba is lost. And certainly, China was lost when this administration came into power in 1953. As I look at Cuba today, I believe that we are following the right course, a course which is difficult, but a course which under the circumstances, the only proper one, which will see that the Cuban people get a chance to realize their aspirations of progress through freedom, and that they get that with our cooperation with the other organ of the states and the organization of American states. Now, Senator Kennedy has made some very strong criticisms of my part, or alleged part, in what has happened in Cuba. He points to the fact that I visited Cuba while Mr. Batista was in power there. I can only point out that if we are going to judge the administrations in terms of our attitude toward dictators, we're glad to have a comparison with the previous administration. There were 11 dictators in South America and in Central America when we came in in 1953. Today, there are only three left, including the one in Cuba. We think that's pretty good progress. Senator Kennedy also indicated with regard to Cuba that he thought that I had made a mistake when I was in Cuba in not calling for free elections in that country. Now, I'm very surprised that Senator Kennedy, who is on the Foreign Relations Committee, would have made such a statement of this kind. As a matter of fact, in his book, The Strategy for Peace, he took the right position. And that position is that the United States has a treaty, a treaty with all of the organization of American states, which prohibits us from interfering in the internal affairs of any other state and prohibits them as well. For me to have made such a statement would have been in direct uh, opposition to that treaty. Now, with regard to Cuba, let me make one thing very clear. There isn't any question but that we will defend our rights there. There isn't any question but that we will defend Guantanamo if it's attacked. There also isn't any question but that the free people of Cuba, the people who want to be free, are going to be supported and that they will attain their freedom. No, Cuba is not lost. And I don't think this kind of defeatist talk by Senator Kennedy helps the situation one bit. Senator Kennedy, would you care to comment? In the first place, I never suggested that Cuba was lost except for the president. In my speech last night, I indicated that I thought that Cuba one day again would be free. 
where I've been critical of the administration's policy and where I criticized Mr. Nixon was because in his press conference in Havana in 1955, he praised the competence and stability of the Batista dictatorship. That dictatorship had killed over 20,000 Cubans in seven years. Secondly, I did not criticize him for not calling for free elections. What I criticized was the failure of the administration to use its great influence to persuade the Cuban government to hold free elections, particularly in 1957 and 1958. Thirdly, Arthur Gardner, a Republican ambassador, Earl Smith, a Republican ambassador in succession, both have indicated in the past six weeks that they reported to Washington that Castro was a Marxist, that Real Castro was a communist, and that they got no effective result. Instead, our aid continued to Batista, which was ineffective. We never were on the side of freedom. We never used our influence when we could have used it most effectively. And today, Cuba is lost for freedom. I hope someday it will rise. But I don't think it will rise if we continue the same policies towards Cuba that we did in recent years, and in fact, towards all of Latin America. When we've almost ignored the needs of Latin America, we've beamed not a single Voice of America program in Spanish to all of Latin America in the last eight years, except for the three months of the Hungarian uh, Revolution. Mr. Morgan, with a question for Senator Kennedy. Senator, last May in Oregon, you discussed the possibilities of sending apologies or regrets to Khrushchev over the U-2 incident. Do you think now that that would have done any good? Did you think so then? Mr. Morgan, I suggested that if the United States felt that it could save the summit conference, that it would have been proper for us to have expressed regret. In my judgment, that statement has been distorted uh, by Mr. Nixon and others in their debates around the country and in their discussions. Mr. Lodge on Meet the Press a month ago said if there was ever a case when we did not have law on our side, it was in the U-2 incident. The U-2 flights were proper from the point of view of protecting our security, but they were not in accordance with international law. And I said that I felt that rather than tell the lie which we told, rather than indicate that the flights would continue, in fact, I believe Mr. Nixon himself said on May 15th that the flights would continue, even though Mr. Herter testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that they had been canceled as of May 12th that it would have been far better that if we had expressed regret if that would have saved the summit and if the summit is useful, and I believe it is. The point that is always left out is the fact that we expressed regrets to Castro this winter, that we expressed regrets to the Eisenhower administration, expressed regrets for a flight over southern Russia in 1958. We expressed regrets for a flight over eastern Germany under this administration. The Soviet Union in 1955 expressed regrets to us over the Bering Sea incident. The Chinese Communists expressed regrets to us over a plane incident in 1956. That is the accepted procedure between nations. And my judgment is that we should follow the advice of Theodore Roosevelt. Be strong. Maintain a strong position. But also speak softly. I believe that in those cases where international custom calls for the expression of a regret, if that would have kept the summit going, in my judgment it was a proper action. It's not appeasement. It's not soft. I believe we should be stronger than we now are. I believe we should have a stronger military force. I believe we should increase our strength all over the world. But I don't confuse words with strength. And in my judgment, if the summit was useful, if it would have brought us closer to peace, but rather than the lie that we told, which has been criticized by all responsible people afterwards, it would have been far better for us to follow the common diplomatic procedure of expressing regret and then try to move on. Mr. Vice President. I think Senator Kennedy is wrong on three counts. First of all, he's wrong in thinking, or even suggesting, that Mr. Khrushchev might have continued the conference if we had expressed regrets. He knew these fights were going on long before, and that wasn't the reason that he broke up the conference. Second, he's wrong in the analogies that he makes. The United States is a strong country. Whenever we do anything that's wrong, we can express regrets. But when the President of the United States is doing something that's right, something that is for the purpose of defending the security of this country against surprise attack, he can never express regrets or apologize to anybody, including Mr. Khrushchev. Now, in that connection, Senator Kennedy has criticized the President on the ground not only of not expressing regrets, but because he allowed this flight to take place while the summit conference, or immediately before the summit conference, occurred. This seems to me is criticism that again is wrong on his part. We all remember Pearl Harbor. We lost 3,000 American lives. We cannot afford an intelligence gap. 
And I just want to make my position absolutely clear with regard to getting intelligence information. I don't intend to see to it that the United States is ever in a position where, while we're negotiating with the Soviet Union, that we discontinue our intelligence effort. And I don't intend ever to express regrets to Mr. Khrushchev or anybody else if I'm doing something that has the support of the Congress and that is right for the purpose of protecting the security of the United States. Mr. Spivak with a question for Vice President Nixon. Mr. Vice President, you have accused Senator Kennedy of avoiding the civil rights issue when he has been in the South, and he has accused you of the same thing. With both North and South listening and watching, would you sum up uh, your own intentions in the field of civil rights if you become president? My intentions in the field of civil rights have been spelled out in the Republican platform. I think we have to make progress first in the field of employment, and there we would give statutory authority to the Committee on Government Contracts, which is an effective way of getting real progress made in this area, since about one out of every four jobs is held by and is allotted by people who have government contracts. Certainly, I think all of us agree that when anybody has a government contract, certainly the money that is spent under that contract ought to be dispersed equally without regard to the race or creed or color of the individual who is to be employed. Second, in the field of schools, we believe that there should be provisions whereby the federal government would give assistance to those districts who do want to integrate their schools. That, of course, was rejected, as was the government contracts provision by the special session of the Congress, through in which Mr. Kennedy was quite active. And then, as far as other areas are concerned, I think that we have to look to presidential leadership. Now, when I speak of presidential leadership, I refer, for example, in our attitude on the sit-in strikes. Here, we have a situation which causes all of us concern. It causes us concern because of the denial of the rights of people to the equality which we think belongs to everybody. I have talked to Negro mothers. I've heard them explain, try to explain, how they tell their children how they can go into a store and buy a loaf of bread, but then can't go into that store and sit at the counter and get a Coca-Cola. This is wrong, and we have to do something about it. So under the circumstances, what do we do? Well, what we do is what the Attorney General of the United States did under the direction of the President. Call in the owners of chain stores and get them to take action. Now, there are other places where the executive can lead. But let me just sum up by saying this. Why do I talk every time I'm in the South on civil rights? Not because I'm preaching to the people of the South, because this isn't just a Southern problem. It's a Northern problem and a Western problem. It's a problem for all of us. I do it because it's the responsibility of leadership. I do it because we have to solve this problem together. I do it right at this time particularly because when we have Khrushchev in this country, a man who has enslaved millions, a man who has slaughtered thousands, we cannot continue to have a situation where he can point the finger at the United States of America and say that we are denying rights to our citizens. And so I say both the candidates and both the vice presidential candidates, I would hope as well, including Senator Johnson, should talk on this issue at every opportunity. Senator Kennedy. Well, Mr. Nixon hasn't discussed the two basic questions. What is going to be done and what will be his policy on implementing the Supreme Court decision of 1954? Giving aid to schools technically that are trying to carry out the decision is not the great question. Secondly, what's he going to do to provide fair employment? He's been the head of the Committee on Government Contracts. It's carried out two cases, both in the District of Columbia. He has not indicated his support of an attempt to provide fair employment practices around the country so that everyone can get a job regardless of their race or color. Nor has he indicated that he will support Title III, which would give the Attorney General additional powers to protect constitutional rights. These are the great questions. Equality of education in schools. About 200% of our population of white people are, is illiterate. 10% of our colored population. 60 to 70% of our colored children do not finish high school. These are the questions in these areas that the North and the South, East and West are entitled to know. What will be the leadership of the president in these areas to provide equality of opportunity for employment, equality of opportunity in the field of housing, which could be done on all federal supported housing by a stroke of the president's pen? What will be done to provide equality of education in all sections of the United States? Those are the questions to which the president must establish a moral tone and moral leadership. And I can assure you that if I'm elected president, we will do so. Mr. Levy with a question for Senator Kennedy. 
Senator, on the same subject, in the past you have emphasized...